Douglas Crimp is a curator, critic, and the Fanny Knapp Allen Professor of Art History at the University of Rochester. Douglas's art criticism has been recognized with two art critics fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and with the Frank Jewett Mather Award for Distinction on Art Criticism from the College Art Association. In addition to his work as an art critic, he has made significant contributions to cultural studies. His 1987 special issue of October on AIDS, reissued as the book AIDS, Cultural Analysis, Cultural Activism, is considered the seminal work on AIDS and cultural representation and a founding text of queer theory. Douglas is the author of On the Museum's Ruins, Melancholia and Moralism, Essays on AIDS and Queer Politics, and Our Kind of Movie, the films of Andy Warhol published last year. Douglas has published essays on Merce Cunningham, Trisha Brown, and Yvonne Rayner in Art Forum and Grave Room, and contributed to the exhibition catalog for Danse Sa Vie at Centre Pompidou. He wrote the liner notes for the film we've just seen, and served as interlocutor for Deborah Hay and Sarah Mitchelson for Some Sweet Day at the Museum of Modern Art last year. It is my distinct honor to welcome Douglas Crimp this evening as our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you, especially to Ryan and Brennan uh, for inviting me. Um, and thanks to Mary in advance and to Andrea for advising and to Anne and Annie. Um, and for all, to all of you for coming. Um, Often when the subject of the art world's current involvement with dance comes up, someone says, there has always been dance in museums. But so far as I can determine, that's not the case. Not being a specialist in dance history, I consulted uh, Mark Franco, who's one of our foremost dance scholars. And he said that he could think of nothing prior to the 1960s uh, the most interesting precedent I know of, he wrote to me, is Donya Foyer's 1965 play for a museum, which was um, a dance designed for and performed at the uh, Historic Historische Museet in Stock Stockholm. The art museum, uh, as we know it, is an institution that emerged in the late 18th century at the moment when Lessing's aesthetic theory divided the arts into distinct spheres. In accordance with that division, art museums were built to house paintings and sculptures, as we know. After its founding in 1929, the Museum of Modern Art expanded this purview to include architecture and design, photography and film, and little known to many of us, I suspect, a short-lived department of theater and dance, which existed from 1946 to 1948. There was at least one evening, and this is the program for it, of dance performances staged at MoMA during this time. It is perhaps better known that when Lincoln Kirsten initially persuaded George Balanchine to come to the US in 1933 to form an American ballet company. It was with a view to performing in the small theater of the new building of the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, which was built by Kirsten's wealthy friend, Chick Austin. But of course, Balanchine had no intention of establishing his ballet company in such a provincial place. It was, uh, wasn't until the modernist paradigm came under pressure from new experiments in art of the 1960s and 70s that museums began more regularly to incorporate live events. One significant early example is Elio Otsika's inauguration of the Parangole, which consisted of an invasion of the opening of the exhibition Opinau 65 at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, by the dancers of the Manguera Samba, Samba School, a kind of festive occupation of the museum by dancers. The first dance event that I remember seeing in a museum is Meredith Monk's Juice from 1969, 
uh, which memorably unfolded on the spiral ramps of the rotunda of the Guggenheim Museum, where I was working at the time, while those of us in the audience lay on the floor to watch. But the history that seems to me most relevant to the contemporary moment of dance in the art world is Merce Cunningham's invention of the event in 1964. Uh, the first one took place in Vienna, where Cunningham's company on the historic 1964 world tour was invited to perform at the Museum of the 20th Century, uh, which had no theater. And determined because of severe economic pressures not to lose an engagement, Cunningham reconfigured passages of his repertory dances into a continuous 90-minute piece for the museum's gallery. The adaptability of the event made it possible for Cunningham's company to perform throughout the years in many different kinds of spaces, and events were performed by his company as regularly as repertory works. And the final performance, of course, of the company before its dissolution was the event that we just saw on film, which was, of course, configured not by Cunningham, but by Swinston, Robert Swinston. Um, and unlike a lot of the events, the dancers, or unlike all of the events before that one, um, the dancers were actually able to choose um, which solos or duets or trios they wanted to dance. Not every choreographer is going to be interested in having his or her choreography reframed by the art museum. And not every kind of dance seems equally appealing to museum curators. Ballet, no matter how modern or contemporary or directly related to visual art, seems to be virtually a taboo. Even for inclusion in exhibitions, to say nothing, obviously, of live performances in museums. One of the few exceptions that I can think of is Ryan McNamara's work for Greater New York, Make Ryan a Dancer, in which he invited various dancers to teach him to dance. And in this case, you see David Hallberg with him. Um, it is nevertheless about ballet that I'm going to talk this evening, because ballet was so important for me when I was finding my voice as an art critic. So this is a chapter, uh, drastically shortened, I'm afraid, uh, but still rather long, I'm also afraid, <laughs> of my memoir before pictures. And the title of the chapter is Agon. <clears throat> Symphony in C is one of George Balanchine's finest ballets. Made for the Paris Opera in 1947, to a newly discovered Bizet symphony, it was originally called Le Palais de Cristal. Leonor Fini designed its set and the differently colored costumes for each of its four movements. But when Balanchine restaged it for Ballet Society, which was the pre pre predecessor of the New York City Ballet, he stripped it of its decor and danced the 52 dancers in black and white black tunics for the men, white tutus for the women. The first time I saw it, I resisted its charm. Seeing it now, I don't know how I could have, but it was undoubtedly connected to my affair with a brawny black modern dancer. I remember saying, it's too ballet blanc for my taste, even though I didn't know what ballet blanc meant at the time. <laughs> I had been taken to the ballet by Veronica Gang, a New Yorker humor writer and avid city ballet goer. To entice me, she told me that, that Balanchine created wonderful, constantly changing patterns of dancers on the stage. She couldn't have been more right about that, but I didn't appreciate the genius of it uh, immediately. Not long after that first encounter with City Ballet, I entered the PhD program in art history of the CUNY Graduate Center, which was then the only one, believe it or not, in which it was possible to specialize in contemporary art and criticism. 
Two former art, cor art forum critics, Rosalind Krauss and Robert Pincus Witten, taught there. I knew Rosalind slightly, and it was with her that I wanted to study. At the Graduate Center, I formed a strong bond with Craig Owens, a classmate who had also come to study with Rosalind. Like me, Craig was gay, but he was several years younger than me and several inches taller. He was also a balletomane, and under his guidance, I was won over to Balanchine. Although my initial skepticism continued in several respects, at least for a while, I didn't like tutu ballets, and I especially disliked story ballets. These weren't so much an issue at New York City Ballet, though, <clears throat> because many of Balanchine's works were performed in practice clothes and most had no explicit story. I quickly came to appreciate the starkly modernist works such as The Four Temperaments, Agon, and Episodes. But there were also a couple of exceptions in the lushly romantic Serenade and La Valse, both of them costumed by Karinska in romantic style ankle length tutus and both telling ambiguous haunted tales. La Valse is probably the least likely ballet for me to have loved so unreservedly at first sight, but maybe I can explain it. Let me say to start that the more I understood about Balanchine, the more I realized that the term modernist applies to his work in general, and not only to ballets choreographed to music by modern composers such as Hindemith, Stravinsky, and Webern, and containing deformed classical movement in which sharp angles replace soft curves, legs turn in as well as out, feet are flexed as well as pointed, and extensions are stretched to the breaking point. But initially, it was only ballets of the Agon type that I apprehended as modernist. Agon, from the Greek for contest, has a commissioned serial score by Stravinsky and is performed in black and white tights and leotards on a brightly lit stage with a backdrop blue as the sky on a crisp, clear day. The choreography is rigorous, almost mathematical. 12 dancers, 12 movements, 12 tone music. The long central pas de deux is, is preceded by two pas de trois, each divided into three parts, the first requiring one man and two, one male and two female dancers, the second one female and two males. Agon begins with a quartet, followed by an octet, then all 12 dancers together. The finale repeats the combinations in different order, 8, 12, 4. Stravinsky based Agon on a French Baroque dance manual by Francois Deleuze. The composition used such early dance forms as the branle, the gaillard, and the saraband, used them, that is, for the two pas de trois, whose choreography also reflects the old forms. The choreography for the opening and closing sections employs such unclassical movements as walking, skipping, sliding into splits, swinging the arms, pulling the elbows in and folding the wrists to flap the hands downward, bending all the way over forward and then backward. The more classical pas de trois has, also has moments of extreme deformation. Dance critic Edwin Denby captured this perfectly when he said of the first pas de trois, quote, in triple canon, the dancers do idiotic slender, slenderizing exercises theoretically derived from court gesture, while the music foghorns in the fashion of musique concrète. This might sound derisive, but it's not. Denby's tone is good natured, and his essay on Agon is a paean. What I found most exhilarating was the pas de deux. 
Denby says of it that Balanchine turned the conventions of the pas de deux upside down. Even not knowing what those conventions are, you can't miss the tension of it, which derives in part from the, fact, from the lack of danceable rhythm in the music. Balanchine said the music should be like one long, 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 long breath. Nor can you miss the unclassical, contorted, sexually suggestive moves the dancers make. At one point, as the dancer lifts the ballerina in front of him, she opens her leg wide in a spread eagle, and he carries her forward. When he lowers her to her feet, she slides into splits and falls backwards between his legs. He drops to his knees, opens his arms, and does a deep backbend to grab her hands, then bends back forward as she rises into arabesque. He supports her there from the awkward position of leaning forward, arms reaching back. At another moment, as he kneels supporting her, she steps over his arm with one leg, which leaves him holding her hand right under her crotch. The male dancer spends a great deal of time on his knees in Agon, in the Agon Pas de Deux, sometimes supporting the ballerina by grasping her leg rather than her arm. At the most dramatic moment, while supporting her in an arabesque on point, he falls to his knees, lies down on his back, then scooches around from sideways to front. Toward the end of the pas de deux, he once again supports the ballerina while lying down. She's not on point this time. Afterward, he gets up on his knees and she collapses her upper body over his in a final embrace. Whether of protection or exhaustion, it's hard to say. <clears throat> Balanchine made the Agon Pas de Deux in 1957 for Diana Adams and Arthur Mitchell. Mitchell, who was black, thought that Balanchine was interested in exploiting the contrast, contrast of white and black skin. Quote, there was a definite use of skin tones in terms of Diana being so pale and me being so dark so that even the placing of the hands on the arms provided a color structure in integrated into the choreographic one. It was surely highly provocative in the late 1950s for such a sensuous pas de deux to be danced by an interracial couple, but nothing seems to have been made of it publicly. Denby wrote simply, the fact that Miss Adams is white and Mr. M Mr. Mitchell Negro is neither stressed nor hidden. It adds to the interest. When I first saw Agon, there were no black male soloists in the company. Suzanne Farrell and Peter Martins danced the performances of it that made the ballet a touchstone for me. Soon thereafter, Mel Tomlinson, a black dancer from the Dance Theater of Harlem, the company founded by Mitchell, joined City Ballet and danced the role with Heather Watts. Wendy Whalen, and Albert Evans formed a more recent celebrated interracial partnership in the Pas de Deux. If Craig was my ballet tutor, the medium for my understanding Balanchine was the choreographer's greatest ballerina, Suzanne Farrell. Um, unfortunately, the, I've cut a huge amount about Farrell out of this, I, uh, for time's sake. I paid careful attention to her right from the start no doubt because Craig was mad for her. He called her Suzanne. In fact, he called all the dancers by their first name. Patricia McBride was Patty, Peter Martin's Peter, and so forth. Of course, Craig wasn't the only ballet goer who adored Farrell. Nearly everyone who was a regular at City Ballet in the late 1970s was as much a Farrell fan as a Balanchine fan. I remember several examples of Craig's feral obsession. One involved an ongoing argument with a young woman who was a Patricia McBride fan. McBride was Farrell's opposite, both in physical type and as a dancer. Relatively short, with a large open face, 
she formed a celebrated partnership in the 1960s with Edward Villela in such ballets as Harlequinade and Rubies from Jules, and later with Mikhail Baryshnikov during his brief stint with City Ballet in 1978 and 79. Possessed of an all-American glamour, she has been described as, quote, not mysterious and grand, but the epitome of normal which is probably why I didn't like her very much. <clears throat> Craig appreciated McBride's qualities as is made plain in his first piece of published writing um, on Balanchine's Coppelia, a short essay on Balanchine's Coppelia, published in the gay monthly magazine, Christopher Street. But when McBride was cast in a role Farrell, that Farrell also danced, he resented it and he would assuage his disappointment by disparaging McBride at intermission to the McBride partisan, who was no match for Craig's intelligence, but every bit as loyal to McBride as Craig was to Farrell. <clears throat> the other example was more unsettling. In the summer of 1979, Craig got a dream job he became the replacement dance critic of the Albany Times Union for the New York City Ballet's two-week summer season at Saratoga. This meant that he could cover Farrell's performances, and he did so in glowing, if necessarily, brief terms. And I quote just a couple of passages from Craig's reviews of City Ballet from that period. Quote, Farrell has danced beautifully at every performance this week. But Friday night, she was magnificent in Balanchine's Tchaikovsky Pas de Deux. The sweep of her line in arabesque, the breadth, of the breadth of her arms in the lifts, the security of her balances were breathtaking. Farrell is the most generous dancer you are ever likely to see. She always gives you that extra flourish which separates sublime dancing from the nearly great. And another one, Farrell provided exactly what the score of movements for piano and orchestra required. She, she surrendered to Stravinsky's jolting accents with an awesome vulnerability, yet she yet was never deflected from the underlying rhythmic regularity. Like Stravinsky's music, which has been described as, quote, a ritual which attempts to overcome the coldness of the world, her demeanor revealed the, the more, that more expression may reside in reticence than in those moments of exuberance in which emotion seems to overflow. As writing on Farrell goes, Craig's isn't especially fanatical in its praise. It's not even all that interesting or specific. When I visited Craig in Saratoga to join him at the ballet for a few days, however, he told me a story that seemed to betray utter bedazzlement. I met Suzanne, he, he announced proudly <clears throat> as soon as I arrived. I told her that I had seen every one of her performances in the, in the past few seasons, and she said, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> he relayed this brief exchange unabashedly, seeming to savor Farrell's dismissive remark simply because she said it to him. That it conveyed distaste for his excessive devotion seemed not to faze him. I eventually realized that Craig's imperviousness to Farrell's put-down wasn't the disturbing lack of self-awareness I thought it was. On the contrary, Craig was just completely self-assured in his bulletomania, which was, I now believe, one of the many manifestations of his unrestrained intellectual enthusiasm. He was as unselfconscious in this instance as he was in many a late night phone call to me in which he would say something like, I'm writing a brilliant essay on whatever it was he was writing on. <laughs> I was at first taken aback by the apparent immodesty, but I grew to understand and appreciate his elation at the processes of his own thinking, sparked by his voracious write reading. And the fact is, he very likely was writing a brilliant essay. He wrote a whole string of them for October between 1977 and 1980, 
Einstein on the Beach, The Primacy of Metaphor, Photography on the Beam, Detachment from the Per Ergon, Earthwords, and the two-part essay, The Allegorical Impulse Toward a Theory of Postmodernism. Many of these essays, I'm sure, many of you know. The piece on Robert Wilson, on the Robert Wilson Philip Glass opera Einstein on the Beach, begins with an epigraph quotation from Jacques Derrida, Jacques Derrida's essay on Artaud in Writing and Difference, which hadn't yet been translated from the French. In the essay, Craig opposed what he considered uh, excessive claims for Einstein on the Beach and argued persuasively that its uh, mythopoeic structure placed it firmly in a symbolist strain of theater whose course had long been fully charted. Craig continued his involvement with Derrida's work by translating section two of the essay, The Per Ergon, from The Truth in Painting, which Derrida had recently published in Paris, but which wouldn't be fully translated into English until 1987. Needless to say, Derrida's deconstruction of Kant's critique of judgment was no easy matter. But Craig's translation is passage for passage, superior to the standard complete translation by Jeff Bennington and Ian McLeod. Craig also added an afterword, which he, he called, <clears throat> playing on the, meeting, the meaning of Per Ergon, a detachment. There he argued that the implication of Derrida's deconstruction of Western art theory is the transformation of art itself beyond recognition, which is the title of, by the way, of uh, the collected essays, posthumous collected essays of Craig. Um, so he, he, sorry, he argued that the implication of Derrida's deconstruction of Western art theory is the transformation of art itself beyond recognition, which would have no, quote, no better point of departure than that which has always been excluded from the aesthetic field, the per ergon, that is the frame, the literal frame as of a painting, the figurative frame, for example, a corps de ballet, the discursive frame, criticism and theory, the institutional frame, a museum or, for example, a proscenium theater. Later, Craig would write, from work to frame, or is there life after the death of the author, an important early essay on the type of art that came to be known as institutional critique. And the proscenic event, a critique of choreographer Tricia Brown's Son of Gone Fishing for what he considered Brown's abandonment of her critical engagement with the proscenium, which had been such a pronounced feature of her first week work for the conventional stage, Glacial Decoy. Quote, if Glacial Decoy, by acknowledging the frame, Glacial Decoy is on the upper left, made contact with the specific conditions of its performance, Son of Gone Fishing, entirely contained within the frame, ignores those conditions. Brown very quickly came to, back to her engagement with the frame. In Set and Reset, for example, and that's what you see on the right, dancers are held aloft and walked horizontally around the stage's side legs, made in this case of see-through mesh instead of the usual solid velour, which rendered the dancers offstage behavior visible, downtime on display, as Brown put it. Craig never returned to Brown's work in his criticism, which was tragically cut short by his death from AIDS in 1990. But in the meantime, he moved on to other issues, the most important and enduring of which was feminism. His, his essay, The Discourse of Others, Feminists and Postmodernism, written for the influential anthology of postmodern theory, The Anti-Aesthetic, was groundbreaking and remains to this day an essential text. <clears throat> uh, 
I was never as fluent with continental theory, not to mention the French language, as Craig. But there was nevertheless a moment when the two of us worked very, very much in concert. We both took a course on photography taught by Rosalind in the fall of 1977. And like Rosalind herself, we were eager to apply our interest in theory to this burgeoning new field of study. The question of photography's relation to art had been much debated in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But with the exceptions of Roland Barthes in France and Alan Sekula in the United States, little in the way of theoretical perspective had been brought to bear on the question more recently. Nevertheless, the market for photographs was beginning its enormous expansion as private collectors and museums embraced the medium as never before. So Rosalind Craig and I sought to remedy the situation by producing October's very first special issue to which each of us also contributed an, es an essay. All of us attempted to theorize photography as a language, and all of us relied to some degree on Derrida. Rosalind on the notion of the trace as it figures in both, both in linguistic theory and in Derrida's essay on Mallarmé, the double session. Craig on the mise en abîme, and I left my reliance on Derrida implicit a measure of my relative insecurity with his work. Craig and I made versions of essentially the same argument, that photographers had developed a photographic language through processes of doubling, such that photographs could be read as images of photography itself. Thus, for example, in Photography on the Beam, Craig wrote of Walker Evans's photograph, Carrie Ross's Bedroom of 1932, that, quote, what we recognize in this photograph, despite its claimed transparency, is an image of the photographic process. This scene must have appeared as a photograph even before Evans exposed it. My essay, Positive Negative, concludes with a passage on a photograph by Edgar Degas of his niece, niece Odette, and I quote a bit from this essay. This is a photograph of the photogenic, everything already resolved into black and white. Even Odette's cute smile is so resolved. She is that age when children lose their baby teeth, and her smile reveals the gaps where two of her incisors are absent. Looking at the photograph now, I realize that it's not her incisors, but her canine teeth that are missing. Um, the preponderance of lace in this photograph is a pun on that smile. Uh, for the French word for lace is dentelle, a diminutive of the word dent, meaning tooth. So Odette's smile is indeed photogenic, already reduced to presence and absence, positive and negative, black and white. It is a wry metaphor for photography. What drew, drew me to Degas's photographs was a series of them he made of ballet dancers. Not, not a surprising subject for him, of course, but the photographs themselves were very surprising. Printed in both positive and negative versions, they were also positive and negative within each version. Degas had employed what is known as the Sabatier effect a form of solarization in which extraneous light is admitted partway through the process of development of the photographic negative, which causes partial reversals of light and dark. I don't remember to what extent my delight in finding these photographs, which were little known at the time, was related to my growing interest in ballet, but it is unlikely that the two interests were entirely separate. Within a year of meeting Craig, I too had become a balletomane. What is balletomania? The term is Russian in origin and seems to have been coined toward the end of the 19th century. Arnold Haskell's Balletomania, The Story of an Obsession, first published in 1934, popularized it in English. Haskell gives a clear sense of its meaning 
in his introduction, albeit in a rather, in rather convoluted phrasing, and I quote, when a work and a company are both so well known that carmine colored nails, objectionable it at all times, can in les sylphides by cutting off abruptly the fine line of the fingers and substituting bloody stumps, producing a feeling of profound, profound irritation, then the right diagnosis is balletomania. Add to this the first uh, sentence of his text proper. It is my firm belief that human society is divided into three distinct, distinct castes, Russian dancers, dancers, and very ordinary people. <laughs> Haskell is an unashamed proponent of balletomania. For others, however, balletomania is a term of scorn. Thus, Akim Volinsky, an important Russian ballet critic during the period of Balanchine's youth, writes in his book of exaltations, quote, it is precisely in ballet as in no other art, that it is impossible to make a move without setting into motion the entire mechanism of enthusiasm and rapture. The enthusiasm is not of a lower order, but rather of a higher one. Yet only he who himself burns with rapture at this time, he who exalts in the same sensations as he shakes open all the doors, windows, and apertures of the soul, can apprehend this. Here we have genuine devotion to the ballet, and not that balletomania that often conceals in itself profanation, lust, and blasphemy. The current New York Times dance critic, Alistair Macaulay, Macaulay's definition is succinct. What is balletomania? Sorry, what is a balletomane? someone who thinks dancers are more important than choreography. Both distinctions between spiritual and carnal desire, between choreography and dancers, seem to me unsustainable. Indeed, Balanchine accused Volinsky himself of balletomania, using Volinsky's very own terms of reproach. And I quote Balanchine, there was a famous critic in Petersburg, his name was Akim Volinsky, I knew him well. He was drawn to ballerinas and created a whole ballet theory out of it, that in ballet, eroticism is the most important thing, and so on. In his reviews, he described how big the thighs of his favorites were, things like that. Balanchine has a point about Volinsky, but what if Balanchine's own theory of ballet aphoristically stated, ballet is woman? It is an article of faith at New York City Ballet that there are no stars. Choreography is the star. To see, to see star dancers, one goes across the Lincoln Center Plaza to American Ballet Theater, where choreography is thought to be secondary. The condescension toward ABT and the balletomania it inspired was something I unthinkingly shared even though I had almost no experience of the rival company. The sense of superiority was easy to absorb, imparted as it was by City Ballet's famously intellectual audience during intermission conversation. But I very much regret now that I participated fully in City Ballet chauvinism in the past, which prevented me from seeing as much as I might have of Baryshnikov in the repertory in which he excelled. Although I did see Natalia Makarova once or twice, I missed out entirely on such great ABT dancers as Carla Fracci, Cynthia Gregory, and Gelsey Kirkland, a high price to pay for buying into other people's snobbism. <laughs> it wasn't a question of snobbism alone, though. My eye had been trained on Balanchine's stripped-down ballets, and I found myself unable to focus on the dancing amidst the sets, props, costumes, and supernumeraries in the traditional 19th century story ballets that formed the foundation of the ABT repertory, and still does. I had no understanding or appreciation of mimed sequences. I much preferred the pure dance, 
white axe, whence Bali Blanc. But even then, I missed Balanchine's bare stage and practice clothes, which brings me back to Laval's. Laval's is less a story than an atmospheric allegory. But of what, exactly? Phrases from John Martin's New York Times review are suggestive. This is clear back when the, when the ballet uh, premiered in 1951. Piquant decadence, sickly hedonism, dainty madness. Choreographing the work to Maurice Ravel's Vals Noble et Sentimentale and Laval's, Balanchine returned in it to ballet romanticism, especially to the equation of dancing with death. Laval's is constructed of a series of eight waltzes danced variously by three women possibly the fates, and four couples, together with a figure of death. The lead ballerina, originally Tannekill Leclerc, Farrell, when I first saw it, wears white. All of the other women wear tutus that are among Karinska's most dazzling creations. Essentially, reinterpretations of the romantic tutu through the lens of Dior's new look, new look they have long gray bodices and skirts made of layer upon layer of different colors of tulle, orange, red, pink, and lavender. The top layer is gray, like the bodice. And at first you think the skirts are a sort of muted crimson. But as the dancers move, you constantly catch flashes of the, of the half spectrum of colors underneath. The women also wear long white evening gloves which accentuate the angular arm movements that form a, uh, an integral part of the choreography. All of the men are dressed in black, which makes the figure of death indistinguishable from the others at first. Francisco Monsignon danced the role of death when Lavalz premiered in 1951, and he was still dancing it when I saw it in the mid-1970s. His seduction of the decadent girl in white takes the form of reclothing her in black, black gloves to cover her white ones, a black tulle robe over her white gown, a black necklace, a black bouquet. He then dances her to death and drops her lifeless body on the ballroom floor. Why was the girl in white referred to as decadent? No doubt because Leclerc danced it that way. According to Monsignon, and I quote, the quality Tanny gave to the character was a kind of discontent and then an avidity, not really greed, for reaching out to something new, a discontent not assuaged by the man she has met, that is, in the eighth waltz, who is another dancer. Somehow, with the death figure, it is the allure of the unknown that tantalized her. She clutches the necklace tries it on, and suddenly something fulfilling begins to happen. She looks into the broken mirror, which distorts her and recoils. Always, death is leading her, leading her. At this point, she's completely mesmerized. And Denby says, the way I remember Tanny's marvelous gesture of putting on the gloves was that when she put her hand into the glove, she threw up her head at the same time so that it was a kind of immolation, you felt, like diving to destruction. Nancy Goldner uses a phrase of Martha Graham's, doom eager. Farrell didn't dance the role with the fervor that clearly characterized Leclerc's performance, but, when, but the way the choreography requires the ballerina to plunge her arms into the long black gloves makes it obvious that she's willingly seduced. My seduction followed hers. Monsignan was no longer the spectacular beauty that he had been in his youth, a beauty obvious in photographs of him by Carl Van Vechten and George Platt Lines. Um, that's Van Vechten on the left and Platt Lines on the right. But Ravel's music for what he called dancing on the edge of a volcano the piquant decadence of Karinska's costumes 
and the ballet's depiction of the ballerina's acquiescence in forbidden pleasures, represented by her eagerly, eagerly donning black garments, struck a chord. As I said, following Craig's lead, I too had become a balletomane. Although our balletomania and our attempts to apply post-structuralist theory to art coincided, we didn't attempt to put the two into any sort of relation. Craig's piece on Coppelia preceded our theory phase. Even though Craig's theoretical bent was nascent in his attribution to Balanchine of, quote, a conviction that the ballet has far more intellectual density than is usually presumed. It is right around the time that Craig became ill in the late 1980s that post-structuralist theory began to be brought to bear on dance by such scholars as Susan Lee Foster and Mark Franco. Theory-informed dance studies has grown into a thriving field of research since then, and I cannot help but wonder what Craig would have made of it. Balanchine's ballets have hardly been the focus. Indeed, the displacement of the Western ballet tradition's centrality has been one of the field's goals from the very beginning. But Balanchine has returned, albeit negatively, to centrality in the recent furor over Apollo's Angels, a, syno a synoptic history of ballet published in 2010 by the New Republic dance critic and NYU distinguished scholar in residence, uh, Jennifer Homans. Homans believes that following Balanchine's death and owing to, quote, our contemporary infatuation with instability and fragmentation, ballet is finished. If it is to be revived, she declares, and I quote, honor and decorum, civility and taste would have to make a comeback. Homans also makes a point of her distaste for the new dance studies. As Mark Franco writes in his angry review of her book, and I quote, in her epilogue, that nasty and self-indulgent little diatribe that contains the key to so much that is erratically incomprehensible in her historiography, she blames dance studies for the ills of dance. And then he quotes Homans, Dance today has shrunk into a recondite world of hyperspecialists and balletomanes, insiders who talk to each other, often in impenetrable theory-laden prose, and ignore the public. And back to Franco, her attention to the public exemplified in this book through the fabrication to the fabrication to match her own fantasy and to blazon her allegiance to Balanchine is hardly a model of intellectual honesty or clarity. Franco ends his review by excoriating Homans's fealty to Balanchine. Quote, this is not just a confused and adisciplinary treatment of ballet history. It is just another pro-Balanchine tract masquerading as history, perhaps the last gasp of the Balanchine as the be-all and end-all version of ballet history. <clears throat> So is Balanchine then the problem? Perhaps rather it is the dominant view of Balanchine as Apollonian, neoclassicist, upholder of ballet as a pure dance art, dance art form. As Franco asserts, Apollo's Angels is a popular rewriting of Slavicist Tim Scholl's scholarly study from Petipa to Balanchine classical revival, and the modernization of ballet. Franco praises Scholl's book as, quote, brilliantly presented theory, a, a brilliantly presented theory of retrospective modernism, which Homans turns into a standard teleological history. It is certainly true that Homans turns, uh, sorry, that Homans narrating history as if Nietzsche's and Foucault's genealogical critiques had never been written, locates the origin and telos of ballet in the Ballet du Coeur. Louis XIV identified himself with the god Apollo 
and danced the role in court ballets. But in spite of its more genealogical conception of classicism, Scholl's book is also tendentious in its arguments and conservative in its conclusions, particularly in its correlation of Balanchine's choreography with the Russian acmeist poets. His argument requires that the innovations of the Soviet avant-garde at the time of Balanchine's early choreographic endeavors in his young ballet in St. Petersburg and those of Diaghilev's Ballet Russe in Paris must be dead ends, developments that Balanchine's 1928 masterpiece choreographed to Stravinsky's Apollon Musagette trans transcended in its return to classicism. The ballet, of course, was retitled later as Apollo. Scholl faults Diaghilev, Fokin, and Nijinsky. Perhaps tellingly, he never mentions Nijinska, the great woman choreographer of the period and also considered a neoclassicist, for their perpetration, sorry, for their perpetuation of two of symbolism's uh, central influences, Wagner and Nietzsche, or more specifically, the Gesamtkunstwerk and the Dionysian principle. The former supposedly resulted in the displacement of choreography and dance technique by music and decor. And here I show you Benoit's decor for Petrushka. Um, <clears throat> and the latter, a re repudiation of the vocabulary of the dance de col that brought in its wake what Scholl describes as, quote, a kind of Dionysian erotomania. <clears throat> Scholl claims that Apollo is Balanchine's direct response to Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn, particularly <clears throat> the latter's flattening of stage space and Nijinsky's final masturbatory gesture, which you sort of see here in this um, famous by, um, Baron de Meyer photograph. <clears throat> um, Scholl underscores his point with the conclusion of Nikolai Minsky's review of the Afternoon of a Fawn, quote, Apollo cedes place to Dionysius and the curtain falls. The curtain falls. Scholl's next chapter begins, as the curtain rises on George Balanchine's Apollo, the eponymous god stands center stage in profile, his right arm extended above and behind him, the left holding a long-necked lute that rests on his hip. Apollo's right extended arm begins to swing in large circles, strumming the lute. The gesture is autoerotic, though its implications have gone politely undiscussed in the criticism. With his flattened pose and unseemly gesture, Balanchine's Apollo begins where Nijinsky's fawn left off. The supremely Dionysian act that concluded Nijinsky's work is a point of departure for Balanchine, whose choreography conveys in one terse gesture the wild, half-human quality of the youth who will acquire nobility through art. That nobility has everything to do, in Scholl's argument, with reconquering the space that Nijinsky's fawn had done away with, the three-dimensionality of both the stage and the dancing body. Scholl claims this dimensionality even for what he calls the ballet's final pose, a pose that has become known as the Apollo logo. And I quote from Scholl, a sunburst formed as the muses lean against Apollo and each extends a leg in arabesque as Apollo gestures toward the heavens. Like Apollo's first position, the pose is flat, a silhouette but its dramatic opening suggests a spatial complexity that Nijinsky's ballet had abjured as the rays of the sun round out and complete the promise of the ballet's opening scene. The trouble is, as Scholl knows and even admits at one point, Apollo didn't begin and end with either of these two images in 1928 when Balanchine made it for, uh, and when Nijinsky's fawn might have been a point of reference. 
Scholl is describing the ballet as Balanchine radically truncated it in 1979 when he revived it for Baryshnikov. The original version began with Leto giving birth to Apollo, who, when he first appears, can barely stand up, much less stroke his instrument. And the repositioning of the logo with which the ballet now ends, as Arlene Croce wrote when this version first appeared, quote, leaves a blank in the progression of the dance. It forces our admiration in a way that seems alien to the spirit of Apollo. The pose, one of the casual wonders of the ballet, used to float into view and dissolve, leaving its light to irradiate the events that followed. <clears throat> Those events culminated in Apollo, Calliope, poly Polyhymnia, and Terpsichore's walk upstage and their climb up the stairs of the platform that has remained on the stage since the birth scene. Why does this matter? For one thing, the minimal stage set devised to replace the original naive stage design by André Beauchamp might remind us that Apollo was a costume drama when Balanchine first made it. These are not the original costumes. These are the costumes that were remade a year later in 1929 by Coco Chanel. <clears throat> and the set's dual purpose as the scene of Leto's birth pangs and the Parnassus to which Apollo and the Muses ascend might remind us of another similarly repurposed and similarly, similarly Russian constructivist looking stage prop, the fence table ship of Prodigal Son an expressionistic narrative ballet that Balanchine choreographed to a Prokofiev score the year following Apollo. Only by forgetting Prodigal Son and making Apollo emblematic in every sense of Balanchine's trajectory can Balanchine's essence be purified of its Dionysian side. For that matter, to become an emblem of timeless classicism, Apollo itself must be purified of all of the elements of its choreography that derive not from the danse de col, but from jazz, gymnastics, and Meyerhold's biomechanics. The flat feet, pelvic thrusts, and skittering on the heels, the swimming lesson, the wheelbarrow, and the troika. This is the swimming lesson. These are images that appear in the ballet. Balanchine's choreography was nothing if not protean. He made dances not only for the ballet stage, but for Broadway and Hollywood, Hollywood musicals, and even for Ringling Brothers circus elephants. He absorbed influences from everywhere, from modern dance, Fred Astaire, and not least from African American dance, from Josephine Baker, Catherine Dunham, and the Nicholas Brothers. He made story ballets and divertissements, marches and waltzes, opera ballets, romantic, classical, and modernist ballets. He made a square dance with a collar and at least one determinedly avant-garde experiment, variations for a, port, for a door and a sigh. Perhaps then it is precisely the, quote, contemporary fascination with instability and relative points of view that Homan's so laments that accounts for Balanchine's hold on us, or at least on Craig and me. While thinking back to my introduction to Balanchine's work through my friendship with Craig and returning to our simultaneous encounter with post-structuralist theory, I pulled my copy of Derrida's Of Grammatology off the shelf and opened it to the title page. There, in my handwriting, was the following. Fourth ring, AA, low numbers, below 20. A note to myself, dictated by Craig, about which tickets to buy at the City Ballet box office. These are the seats Craig and I always sat in, the single row on the fourth ring side arms of the New York State Theater, as far back as possible away from the stage. They were inexpensive, which was essential since we went to the ballet four or five times a week. The seats 
weren't available by subscription. So the sooner we got to the box office right after tickets went on sale, the more likely we were to get our preferred seats, fourth ring, double A, one and three, or two and four. This means that my entire formative experience of Balanchine's ballets was from an oblique angle very high up. Many of Balanchine's works are best seen from the upper balconies of the theater where the floor patterns and the resulting play of spatial volumes is more distinct, writes Scholl, for whom this architectonic quality is yet another of Balanchine's correspondences with acmeism. For me, and I think I can say this for Craig, this obliqueness, this oblique, obliquity, is what allowed us to reframe Balanchine, to release him from the neoclassical purity that would cordon him off from our other interests at the time, foremost among them what came to be called postmodern theory. In trying to imagine what Craig might have made of the current conjunction of dance and theory and the art world's enthusiastic embrace of dance, I return to the Per Ergon. I suggested above, quoting detachment from the Per Ergon, that the lesson Craig drew from his engagement from Derrida was that we should attend to what aesthetic theory had heretofore excluded, the frame, which supposedly differentiates the intrinsic from the extrinsic in the work of art. Derrida asks, what if the question of aesthetics is not what is intrinsic or what extrinsic to the work of art, but rather the impossibility of distinguishing the two? What if we were to understand the frame not only as, quote, a detachable part, a separate part, but also a non-detachable part, a non-separate part, since it constitutes the articulation between the two others? Derrida riffs, of course, throughout the Paragon on Kant's intention that the critique of judgment bridge the gulf between the first two critiques, those of theoretical and practical reason. In other words, heeding Craig's call to turn our attention to the Paragon, among those aspects of the frame to which we need to attend are its instability, the impossibility of locating it, fixing its place with regard to arts inside and outside. How might this apply to Balanchine's ballets? According to dance historian Lynn Garofola, the strict hierarchies of the classical ballet under Petipa, quote, mirrored the hierarchy that governed all aspects of imperial life. Ranks determined the minimum or maximum number of dancers who could appear in a group. Corifé could dance in groups of no more than eight, second soloists in groups of no more than four, first dancers in groups of no more than two. The ballerina danced alone. Thus, hierarchy was built into the very substance of the choreography. It also went to the heart of the ballet's social message. The corps de ballet occupies the lowest level of the hierarchy. Jill Johnston, champion of postmodern dance, wrote, quote, in ballet, the frame remains a frame. The corps de ballet is often seen to form a frame within a frame to make it clear that something is being framed, a frame up. <laughs> Derrida elaborates, quote, the violence of framing proliferates. Although a modernist construal of Balanchine generally focuses on his reduction of ballet to its essentials, his stripping away of storyline, sets, and costumes, such that ballet becomes nothing more than movement in relation to music, such a reduction is clearly inapplicable to most of his works. Moreover, the simplest deconstructive approach reveals the uncertainty of its results. Scholl tells us that Balanchine's black and white costumes are designed not to be noticed. But then he makes clear that they are precisely what is noticed, 
quote, the sparse minimalist works of Balanchine's American period are known as black and white ballets. Even Serenade, the first, Balanchine, uh, the first ballet Balanchine made in America, suggests to Scholl that Balanchine's intention was the legibility of the body, although after its premiere in 1935, he dressed it up rather than down. Simple tunics became romantic tutus. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is Scholl. The skirts that Barbara Karinska with Balanchine developed for Serenade differ from their romantic models in two important ways. First, they are not as full as the traditional skirts. They are lighter and more motile. In performance, the skirt flies to a much greater extent than those typically worn in the 19th century, in accordance with the quicker tempi and invigorated choreography of Balanchine's romantic reverie. They are also more revealing. The front of the skirt contains a white panel of tull that shows the, working of the workings of the legs more clearly. Thus, even in a work with obvious historical illusions, with costumes dictated more or less by tradition, the Balanchine priorities are, um, are apparent. But what seems to me most radical about Serenade is its dissolution of, of classical ballet hierarchy through the motility not only of the dancing body, but of the frame. It is legendarily a ballet Balanchine made for 17 women students of the newly founded School of American Ballet, a ballet of patterns, a ballet of constant movement, a ballet to train an ensemble. In one sense, Serenade is a ballet that is all corps de ballet. Occasionally, dancers do break free of the ensemble to dance solos. And over the years, Balanchine gave greater emphasis to three principal female roles and added a pas de deux. But no description of Serenade could securely fix its frame beyond saying that it is in perpetual motion. I've seen the ballet scores of times, and I can rarely remember at any given moment what will come next. Of course, not all of Balanchine's ballets do away with the hierarchies of the classical ballet. Many, like Symphony in C, are made in the mold of Petipa. But even in, in Symphony in C, in the rousing finale, the frame calls attention to itself as frame. The, uh, as the core of 36 women line the stage on either side and perform a series of quick, repetitive tendu, it's hard to look at anything else. Others of, Bal of Balanchine's ballets, for example, Concerto Barocco, while maintaining the division between corps de ballet and principal dancers, give equivalent, equivalent choreographic weight to each. And at least one of Balanchine's greatest ballets, Le Tombeau de Couperin, is made for the corps alone. I don't mean to claim that the mobility of the frame and the attendant de-hierarchizing of choreography are the sole determinants of Balanchine's ballet modernism. Rather, I think that they are those that, mo that are most compatible with Craig's and my simultaneous Balanchine balletomania and interest in post-structuralist theory. Although the latter led to our theorizing postmodernism, we first used it as committed modernists to show how certain photographic images, uh, photogra so, sorry, to show how certain photographs image the processes of the photographic medium. And if the Per Ergon reveals that the question of aesthetics is not of what is intrinsic and what extrinsic to the work of art, but rather the impossibility of distinguishing between the two, then perhaps the imbrication of the modern in the postmodern and the postmodern in the modern was what we saw in Balanchine's ballets from the oblique angle of our fourth ring seats, double A, one and three, or two and four. Thank you.